Okay, welcome to Unit 5. This is our unit on Scientific Revolution and Enlightenment. Um, pretty interesting unit. There's going to be a lot of changes that go on in the world at this point in time, a lot of theories that pop up um, that men discover and develop. Um, so we're going to see how that changes uh, what the world looks like at that time. So um, the Scientific Revolution was actually a very interesting time period, uh, exciting era to live in. It lasted for about 200 years. Uh, beginning around 1500, and it continued on until 1700. And it's during this time, there are so many changes going on in society. There was a cultural, intellectual, and philosophical shift from thinking that the universe had been divinely created to thinking that the world could be understood through study and observation. But it's not just the rejection of traditions like we saw in the Renaissance period. It's a whole new era of discovery and development. So science was not of any great um, interest to folks during the Renaissance, let alone important. Mm -hmm. Now there were a few who dabbled in it here and there, but folks like da Vinci were certainly not the norm. We see the revival of pure science, meaning people truly wanting to study science. And when um, new developments in astronomy, they come along and this guy, um, Nicholas Copernicus, his name is not Nicholas Copernicus, please don't say that, his name is Nicholas Copernicus. Um, he was responsible for this new interest. So Copernicus was from Poland. He studied planetary motion for over 25 years. Around the year 1510, he began to develop a model of the universe that answered many of the questions that had been unresolved for many, many years. The heliocentric model um, sometimes you hear it referred to as the heliocentric theory, states that the sun is the fixed center of the universe, not the earth as previously believed. It states that the stars and planets revolve around the sun. And by 1514, he had begun to share his findings with a few close friends who then spent years trying to prove his theory by gathering more observations. He wrote a book where he stated this theory and shared it, um, shared the observations that he had seen. Now, this book is titled On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Bodies. He was afraid to publish this book uh, due to the potential ramifications from the Catholic Church because this was not the teaching of the church. So his book, while it contains very revolutionary work and ideas, did not get published until the year that he died, which was 1543. So there was really no big deal made over his discovery, but it is in fact a very big deal. And over the next 150 years, scientists built on his theory. So word of Copernicus's work had spread quickly. Um, there was a German mathematician by the name of Johannes Kepler. And Kepler stated three important things. First, that the planets move around the sun on ellipses. Second, that they don't all move at the same speed. And third, that velocity or speed of each planet throughout its orbit is in direct proportion to how far away it is from the sun. But what he does that is super important is that he was able to prove Copernicus was right about the heliocentric theory. Interesting fact about Kepler. Um, when he was a small child, he had had a very, very bad bout of smallpox. And um, it actually left him extremely nearsighted, so he could only see things that were super up close to his face. Um, he was not actually able to gather his own data. He's looking at the stars and the planets. It's hard to do. They're so far away. He's nearsighted. Um, but what he was able to do um, was use tons and tons of astronomical tab tables and charts that his teacher had left him um, to prove all of this. This is pretty amazing stuff, especially when you consider the lack of technology that he had. Um, oh, and one more thing. He was so far ahead of everyone else at his time um, that even Galileo ignored his findings at first. They all thought he was a little, little crazy, a little office rocker. So even Galileo ignored um, Kepler's findings. So speaking of Galileo, um, he was an Italian man who studied the new astronomy theories that were out at the time and continued to build on them. He was an absolute genius in astronomy, mathematics, and physics. 
Um, he was as famous in his time as Einstein was in the 1900s. He built his own telescope in 1609, and within a sh few short years, like, well, less than a year, really, by 1610, he had published his book, The Starry Messenger, which stated three of his findings. First, that the moon had a rough surface, okay? Um, second was that there are dark spots on the moon, okay? And the third of his findings, um, and this is the most significant, was that Jupiter has moons. Well, this totally freaks out both the Protestant and the Catholic churches. Why? Well, because Galileo implied that scripture had a little bit of wiggle room to it where science did not. That science is absolute, science is true, scripture had a little bit of wiggle room to it. Um, so the church did not feel that 2,000 years of tradition uh, should be undone just because of this one guy's theories that seemed to them to be a little wackadoodle, okay? He was warned not to spread any more of his ideas or spread Copernicanism, um, so like to spread the ideas of Copernicus. In 1632, Galileo published a book that supported Copernicus. In 1633, he found himself in court, and only because he was threatened with torture did he retract his earlier statements. So he agreed with the court and read aloud a written confession that Copernicus was in fact wrong. He ended up spending the rest of his life on house arrest until he died in 1642. But just because he was on house arrest doesn't mean his ideas and thoughts were arrested too. He continued to spread his ideas and theories. It wasn't until 1992, 1992, when the Catholic Church actually acknowledged that Galileo was in fact correct in his findings. And so that brings us to this handsome fellow, uh, Isaac Newton. Newton studied math and physics at Cambridge University in England. By the time he was 26, he had realized that all physical objects are equally affected by the same forces. His greatest discovery, though, was the law of universal gravitation. And this stated that the same force ruled the motion of planets and all matter on Earth and in space. In 1687, Newton wrote Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophies. This is one of the most important scientific books ever to be written. It is in this book that we find the closest thing to a scientific theory of everything, and it dominated the world of physics until the mid-20th century. So, until the mid-1900s, he goes on. Um, he goes on to describe the universe like a giant clock, and he firmly believed that God was the creator of the orderly universe in which he lived. All right, I think I saved the best for last. So maybe you guys won't think he's the best, and that's okay. But um, I think this guy is pretty cool, and he's probably my favorite one that we're going to talk about. Actually, he is my favorite that we're going to talk about in this unit. This guy is William Harvey. He was an Englishman who studied at the University of Cambridge in England. Um, he's a little bit of a rebel, as many of these guys were, but he pretty much ignored the medical textbooks he was told to use and learn from. He preferred to make his own observations, take notes, and draw his own conclusions by doing live dissections. Yes, I said live dissections, okay? Now, before you just decide that I have some kind of sick idea of what's cool, you have to understand that at this point in time, in the 17th century, so we're talking about the 1600s, many Western states had come to believe that certain people deserved to have their bodies desecrated, okay? This was just one of the belief systems at that time. It was seen as a final punishment for those who had committed terrible crimes like murder, treason, or counterfeiting, um, and as a result, these criminals were viewed as being worthless. So because he was doing live dissections to figure out how the body and organs functioned, his test subjects were often in great pain for an extended period of time, sometimes weeks or even months, okay? So it's not like he was just saying, hey, who wants me to do a live dissection on them? These were people who had actually been um, considered criminals, okay? Um, so he published a book in 1628 called The Motion of the Heart, and he was the first guy to accurately describe how the blood circulated through the body as well as how the heart functions. So, of course, 
you can imagine that his work was highly criticized as dissections of the human body, whether live or dead. Um, that wasn't really a commonly accepted uh, practice at this time, okay? Uh, William Harvey ended up dying of a brain hemorrhage when he was 79 years old. So I know that um, you guys are probably a little freaked out by him and what he did, but again, when you think about the lack of technology that he had, it's pretty amazing that he was able to figure out how you know blood goes into the heart and comes out of the heart, that whole circulatory system thing going on, and how the heart's related to it as well. Okay, so prior to the scientific revolution, Europeans viewed science and magic no differently. It's not until the 1500s when we start to see scientists beginning to perform experiments and use math to solve all sorts of mysteries. This is the time period when we see the scientific method develop. And I know that you're all familiar with the scientific method, but just as a reminder, it is an objective, logical, and systematic way of collecting empirical data and arriving at reasoned conclusions. The steps are define, um, the steps are define the problem, review the literature, form a hypothesis, choose a research design, collect the data, analyze the data, and finally present the conclusions. Okay? So because of this uh, revolution that has occurred, there were changes to everyday life. Okay? Now, as a result, we see improved roads. Okay, we're going to see better roads. Um, we're going to start to see where they are higher in the center, just slightly elevated in the center, um, so that the water can run off the road and go to the side of the road. Um, we're going to see better tools. Okay, so people are going to be able to do their jobs better because they have better tools, better ways to do things. And we also see new ship design. So life is going to start getting a whole lot better for folks a whole lot quicker now that we have some new inventions, some new um, theories, and some new thoughts on things. So um, that wraps it up for today. I'll see you next time.